With that, let me introduce Craig Coker. He spent over 35 years in planning, permitting, design, construction, operation of composting facilities. He's dealt with animal manures, animal mortalities, food waste, biosolids, yard trim, and just about everything else. He serves now on the board of directors of the Virginia Recycling Association. He's a senior editor at BioCycle, and that's a big deal to me. Craig has training both as an engineer and as a scientist. He's got experience with windrow comp composting, aerated static piles, aerated composting, in-vessel and hybrid systems, and both aerobic and anaerobic digestion. Craig was raised in suburban Maryland, then he moved to a more peaceful lifestyle in rural Virginia. So Craig is going to talk today about uh, siting and design. Craig, it's all yours. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk today about site selection and design, which is one of the more important aspects of compost facility development for a number of reasons. Uh, some of the content in this slide presentation comes from the U.S. Composting Council's Compost Operator Training Course. The key, of course, in any real estate transaction, as we all know, is location, 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 which creates the, uh, the real paradox in composting facility development. You want to be close to the materials and the markets, the materials being where you source your feedstocks, the markets being where you deliver your products, and we'll talk about some, some guidelines for that uh, distance. So you need to be close to your feedstocks and close to your markets, but you need to be pretty far from everything else for obvious reasons. And so we end up in a compromise position where we try to make the best of what we can, can uh, get our hands on in terms of land, uh, for a composting facility. And cost, of course, is a very big issue. And one of the great challenges in Maryland and in Northern Virginia and the metropolitan Washington region is the very high cost of land. So location considerations of any kind of composting facility are shown here. Size, environmental protection, access, buffers, and zoning and regulations, and of course, cost. So let's uh, take a look at environmental protection. Now, composting has potential impacts to water and air. How hard you work to have to work to negate those impacts depends on the specifics of the site. How close is groundwater? How close is surface water? How uh, geography has a lot to do with odor movement. Are you, uh, is the site up on a hill? Is it down in a valley? How close are the neighbors? There's all sorts of environmental features that guide the appropriate site selection. On, the, on access, you've got to be close to a major road. I recommend sites be within five miles of a four-lane divided transportation arterial. Um, sort of like an uh, example would be US 29 between Washington and, Bank and Columbia, Maryland. Four-lane divided arterial. Uh, should be between 50 and 75 miles for your feedstocks as well as 50 to 75 for markets. If you're next to an interstate, you can stretch that to about 100 miles. The key is in travel time, because if it takes more than an hour and a half for the truck to either bring your feedstocks to you or for you to ship product to market, the economics of hauling greatly affect the, the viability of the facility. With regard to utilities, if you're using aerated static pile, you almost always have to have access to three-phase power. Now, normal household power or a power in your office is called single phase, 120 volt power, or 110 volt power, rather. A three-phase is 230 volt to 460 volt power, uh, and it's used for larger horsepower motors to reduce the operating cost. The great challenge is that if three-phase power is not at your site, you have to bring it in, and the cost of extending three-phase power I got a quote for a site last week at $200 per running foot of electrical line, uh, which is very pricey. Uh, water and sewer. Uh, in some cases, if you have a sewer line nearby, then you have the ability to manage some of your more problematic wastewaters with the sewer. 
In other cases, you probably have to plan on either a trucking out, a truck out to a treatment plant if you can find one, or you will have to plan on a well. I mean, a septic field, septic tank, and drain field. You will need fuel. You'll need fuel for on-road trucks and for off-road equipment. So you may need to have a fuel uh, station, of a small fuel station at your site. And of course, you'll need the traditional telecom and, and uh, internet capabilities. And in some rural sites, that can be quite a challenge. Zoning and regulations are another uh, issue that is becoming more and more of an important issue. And we're seeing this now in Howard County, Maryland. We're seeing it in Frederick County. Uh, just two recent examples about how zoning issues or on-farm composting have really uh, become quite the contentious issue in terms of where to site facilities. Uh, buffer zones uh, are the amount of space between the composting facility and surrounding land uses that may or may not be compatible. There are some minimums in the regulations in every state. By and large, those, are, those minimums are, are, are a little too small and good, good management practice suggests that you would use something a little larger. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Zoning is a give you a little bit of verbiage from the world of zoning for those of you who have may not be familiar Zoning categories for a particular land use are either allowable use by right Allowable use by conditional use permit or they're not allowed at all So for example, if you want to put an asphalt uh, plant in a residential zone, that's not an allowable land use uh, if you want to put a composting facility on a farm in some cases, that's an allowable use by right because that's an agricultural type operation. And in other cases, it's only allowable by conditional use. So if allowable use by right means the zoning ordinance for that jurisdiction, usually county or city government, is written so that that particular usage is allowed in that zone. So if you are in a manufacturing zone or an industrial zone, chances are very good that you, are, you will have and allow the use by right to build a composting facility. More often we find that they are conditional use permit driven activities. So if you have a farm and you wanna bring in feedstocks from off the farm, say food waste from the community nearby, and you wanna sell your compost offsite, in many cases you will have to get a conditional use permit from your local government. And the conditions that they will impose on that permit include things like what are acceptable truck routes? What roads can you not go down? What are your hours of operation? What are maximum noise levels, et cetera, et cetera. There's usually a two-step public hearing process, number one, through the planning commission for the jurisdiction, and number two, by the elected governing board. These public hearings are usually contentious because people will hear about your project and they will react in many cases rather negatively. This is an example of a client of mine in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. The county imposed a conditional use permit condition that he was to install a public bathroom, but the site had no water and no sewer, and he didn't want to build, a, didn't have a budget for a septic tank and a drain field, so he built one of the nicest outhouses I've ever seen. Another aspect of siting is meteorology. Uh, all, all sites are subject to a cer certain amount of prevailing wind, that the wind tends to blow from one direction or one or two directions more so than others. And we, we analyze data from airports, which is available from the National Climatic Center in Asheville. Uh, and we analyze this data on an hourly basis over a five year period and we build what's called a wind rose. And what you see here is the wind rose for Royal Oak Farm composting facility near me here in Virginia. So at Royal Oak, the wind blows predominantly out of the Northeast toward the Southwest. And the, which is shown by the triangular arrows that you, the triangular patterns you see in this diagram and the different colors represent different wind speeds as recorded uh, at the airport. Now, airport, the, these work very well where the airport conditions are representative of the site conditions. If you're up in the mountains, like uh, I am in Western Virginia or where I used to live in Asheville, North Carolina, 
it's very hard to be representative because of the terrain. But still, it gives you an idea of the, where the prevailing wind is coming from. And the way you use that in site design is to make sure that those activities that may have some odor problems associated with them are not located in a, in a way on the site where the prevailing wind can pick that odor up and carry it downwind to a sensitive receptor. And then of course cost is an issue. Um, land costs are very high in many cases and that's leading to a growing amount of interest in innovative and creative reuse of sites. For example, there's a composter in Eastern Pennsylvania uh, who started out with an on-farm system. He has since partnered up with an aggregates company and they're building composting facilities in mined out quarries, reusing mined out quarries for a composting facility. There have been a couple of efforts done over the years to look at brownfield projects, uh, to put them at sanitary landfills or in the, on the land where a sanitary landfill is built, but not on the landfill itself, uh, and other types of innovative uses like that. Yeah, I recommend that before you go too much further in the project planning, you do a formal siting study. Uh, these, this involves looking at whatever prior studies might have been done in that area for some form of uh, waste management or other form of infrastructure project, because there's often a lot of good data there. Uh, define the selection criteria that are important. Filter the different sites against those selection criteria and rank, sort and rank the sites. Develop a short list of the pros and the cons of each site and work through perhaps in some cases a public workshop so that the people around those sites know what you're thinking before project before the plans get too finalized. Open and open and transparent public participation goes a long way in a more effective siting uh, process. These are the criteria that the Sonoma County, California Waste Management Authority used when they decided to move their composting facility. So they were looking at transportation impacts, as you see here, neighborhood impacts, uh, environmental, of course, cultural resources. In many cases in the, uh, in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, there's a very rich archaeological heritage of pre, uh, you know, of Indian natives that lived in these areas many, many years ago. And so in some cases, site development can be affected by the presence of those archaeological resources. Hydrology and water quality, most of the mid-Atlantic is drained by the Chesapeake Bay, which has obviously significant water quality issues and that is affecting compost facility siting and design uh, today and it will for some time. Site costs, of course, um, how the land is designated not only now but in the future, uh, visual impacts, etc. But you need a lot of space. No composter I have ever met in the last 40 years of practice has ever said, I wish I had a smaller site. So you need room to compost, you need room for equipment to move around, you need room to store materials and store equipment, you need room for people, uh, you need room to handle the water that's coming off the site. You need a lot of space. We'll talk about that. Now, when you lay a site out, when you're looking at a piece of land and you're thinking, well, how am I going to lay this out so it fits? You want to try to minimize materials handling inefficiency. So you, you have to study the flow of materials or imagine the flow of materials through your site to look for where there might be bottlenecks or other kinds of inefficiencies. You always want to try to maintain a lot of flexibility because you've got a lot of material to move around on the site and you need a lot of flexible opportunity to do that. Your feedstocks and your finished products need to be at opposite ends of the site to avoid any kind of cross-contamination of product with waste. The site needs to be set up for easy housekeeping and maintenance. And of course, many states require uh, various degrees of control, access, and security. Um, in fact, right before this webinar, I was working on a report for a client in Dickerson, Maryland, about developing a small site, and they're going to have to put a perimeter fence around a four-acre site. That's not inexpensive. 
So here's one potential site sketch of how a site might get laid out. You have an entrance road, and the entrance road usually is a, is a hardened asphalt driveway apron built to a DOT specs. You have the site oriented uh, in a way that you can understand the impact of the prevailing wind, and you have it sloped in a way that allows you to capture and control contact water, non-contact water, run on, and other forms of storm water. Usually a lockable gate is needed, and that's where you put your, your required signage. Um, you have an office usually by the front of the site. You have a counterclockwise circulation pattern. You have separate areas for feedstock preparation, composting. You have your stormwater retention pond that ideally runs off into an infiltration basin or infiltration area. Some of that retention water being recycled. Curing is a separate area. Screening is a separate area. And then product storage and distribution. So a very linear flow path through the site so that the materials are handled the fewest number of times, the fewest number of physical changes between each movement. This is a site in western U.S. that I uh, took, I was invited to, to uh, do an operations evaluation and the arrows show one of each one is one of 11 different materials handling steps which are enumerated in the lower left for how this material moves around the site and as you can see those arrows overlap themselves a lot and that's a very inefficient site layout that kind of when i was there doing the measurements front end loaders were zooming past each other fortunately they were good loader operators and they didn't crash into each other but the potential was there that's one of the reasons why you don't have this sort of crossover pattern. This is Blue Head Organics in Sussex County, Delaware that I designed several years ago. We designed the site so all traffic comes in here through the entrance road. Waste receipt is here. Grinding with its 200 foot safety radius is here. This is all compost area. So composting takes place here. Curing on this side of the site screening in here, product storage here, and then out the door. So it's a linear, very linear pattern with the fewest amount of, of uh, interferences between the various functions. As I said before, no one has ever said that they wish that a storm uh, was onto the site from uphill sources. And that needs to be diverted completely around the site and away from the facility. Uh, and allow you to maximize, uh, and you have to maximize however far you can be from a natural water course. Almost all state regulations stipulate a minimum distance, but it's only like 100 feet. And it really needs to be more like 200 to 500 feet. Obviously, you need to have uh, plenty of room for parking, for employees, for equipment storage, and things like that. Traffic flow, uh, if you're going to have a scale house for well, way scales for your facility, you need to set that in so, what, so the trucks don't queue up onto the public roads. And if you can, take advantage of natural barriers because out of sight is out of mind. And another uh, a more accurate statement is people smell with their eyes. If they can see your facility, the chances are pretty good they're going to complain about it at some point. So we see here uh, an, a photo of an on-site composting facility uh, where all the compost is used on-site. This is in California. This is another California facility called Z-Best in Gilroy. And you can see how crowded this site is. This site is pretty full. This is the uh, Gore system at the uh, uh, Cedar Grove composting facility in Everett, Washington. Again, very crowded site, but it does have some some good site design, even though it is very full. You have a counterclockwise traffic flow for waste receipt. Material flow is very linear from front to back. This is the uh, Inland Empire Utilities Authority composting facility, Cheeto, California. This is a converted IKEA warehouse here. 
and all the air. It's an extended air rated static pile facility inside the warehouse, curing in this building in the back, and then a biofilter here. But this is a good site because notice the surrounding neighbors, wastewater treatment and a prison. So which is the, where's the odor coming from and does anybody complain? Well, okay, now we're going to have some po two poll questions to see if you've been paying attention. So here's poll question number one. Which of these is not a significant consideration in siding a composting facility? So one of these is not a significant consideration. Prevailing, number one, prevailing wind direction and speed. Number two, depth and thickness of wooded buffer areas. Number three, suitability of roads for truck traffic. Number four, distance employees have to commute. Number five, depth to seasonal high groundwater table. Number six, cost of land. And number seven, distance to residences. One of those is not a significant consideration. Which one is it? Give okay, me a few minutes to answer that question. Yeah, I've launched that poll and uh, already, already about half of you had to have uh, weighed in. We'll just give you another 10, 10 seconds. And, uh, e e either this one was really, really easy or really, really hard because most of them have, have cho chosen the same thing. Okay, just n another five seconds, folks. Alrighty. So I'll end that poll. And then are you, Craig, are you able to see those results? I am, and everybody got it right. Almost everybody got it right. Yeah. Well done. Okay, there's another one later on, so we'll, we'll move on. So how big do you want to make a site? It obviously depends on two things, how much you're going to be bringing in in terms of feedstocks and how much product you have to make to meet, meet your market demand. And those two front and back end considerations really define the size of the site, coupled with uh, pro, uh, the size the size implications of different composting technologies, which we'll take a look at here. So you have annual and seasonal uh, variations in feedstock. This is a graph of the leaf collection program in Sacramento, California. Uh, you see obviously a lot of materials in the late spring, a second uh, peak in the fall, of course. So if you were to des design a site to manage this seasonality, You've got to have some ability to meet the peaks more so than the average flow conditions, but you don't want to oversize it so that uh, everything is designed for peak. So the way you would do it is build some storage areas into the site design on the front end uh, to manage it. So the kind of technology you use to compost affects uh, the amount of space you need. The processing equipment and the technology you choose uh, will dictate how much land area you need. Windrow composting takes more land area than aerated static pile composting, obviously. Um, in Europe, we see the extended, extended trapezoidal pile systems. We, we don't see many of those here in the US. They take up even less space. If you have a windrow composting operation, you will certainly have more space requirement depending on how you set up your windrows. For example, if you've got a, if you're using a bucket loader to turn your windrows, uh, or you're using a turner that only turns half a windrow at a time, you need the biggest lanes in between your windrows. With a tow behind straddle turner, you still need room for this, the tractor to move around. So in the, this graphic here, the tractor travels in this lane to turn this windrow and this windrow travels in this lane to turn this windrow, travels in this lane to turn this windrow. So a straddle turner, a straddle turner or a self-propelled straddle turner is the most economical uh, because the space between your windrows here can be as low as three feet. Whereas with a tow behind turner, uh, you've got to have at least a 15 to 18 foot center aisle for that tractor to go down. Then the trapezoidal system, essentially you're taking this entire pile and moving it 10 feet this way, turning it again, moving it 10 feet back this way. So the entire pile moves. That's the most economical in terms of space. But 
we don't see many of those here and not many states will allow them because of fire considerations. So let's say, take a look at some examples. We have a 78, for 5,000 cubic yards of material, we need 78,000 square feet if we use a small windrow turner pulled by a tractor. Uh, we need 32,600 square feet if we're using a large straddle, uh, 20,200 with trapezoidal, and only 18,700 with extended area and static pile. So clearly some, uh, the kind of technology you pick, or the composting approach rather, for, for your composting feedstocks depends in part on, of course, the feedstocks, but in part upon your site and how much room do you have. So, this is an example of uh, two particular acres in southeastern Pennsylvania run by Ned Foley, who some of you may know. Uh, Ted, uh, Ned started out in 05 with this configuration for his tractor pull turner, and you can see how this is his turn lane here and here and on the outside. A few years later, he switched to aerated static pile and he was able to increase his throughput by a factor of six by virtue of the higher processing density of the pad. So always have to keep room for all parts of this manufacturing operation. You have to have the ability to receive feedstocks in a timely fashion and process them in a way so they don't sit stockpiled on your receipt pad for more than 24 hours. You need some way of diverting your non-compostables to either recycling or disposal. That takes a certain amount of space. You have to have room to prepare your feedstocks and mix them together. That takes space. You need your active composting area where you're holding your materials in one spot for 21 to 30 days maybe longer depending on weather. Your product management side of the house starts with your curing or maturation function, and that takes as much as 60 to 90 days, and sometimes longer in cold weather. Uh, you need room for a screening function, you need room for storage in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, I recommend at least three months storage because you're really not gonna sell a lot of compost in December, January, or February, and quite often, the, the slow sale season runs from Halloween to Easter, uh, depending, again, depending on the nature of the weather. So you could need as much as five or six months of storage. So you have a lot of different functions in this manufacturing process that you need to make room for. Then you have water management, you know, odor and dust control, various. So you need a lot of room for doing all these different things. So let's look now at various utilities and other services that you're gonna need for your facility. Security, gates and fencing are almost always required by regulation. Scales are not required, but they're extremely useful. Um, they do add a lot of cost, about $100,000 in capital cost, but it's a lot easier to invoice on a per ton basis than a, on a volume basis and a lot less um, pushback about what the invoice is for. Lighting, some sort of security lighting is usually needed. Landscaping is uh, essential and so is a visual barrier. So here we have an example of a scale house and platform scales. Uh, I would have put the scale house on the other side so that I could reach out the window and talk to the driver instead of having to get out and walk, out, walk outside. But again, that may have been a constraint of this particular site. Obviously, you have to have some degree of comfort for the employees. An office, uh, if you have an office where you are going to be open to the public, chances are good your planning commission will require it be ADA compatible, compliant. So you'll have a wheelchair ramp for anybody, any disabled persons who visit the site. Signage is critical. Um, most states require informative signage at the front of the facility such as what we see here on the Grover site in California. Um, usually some form of contact phone number and what is acceptable and where things should go and various forms of information for clients of, you know, what you can, where to, where to turn, what are prices, etc. 
what to do that are instructions on where to put things, behavior modification signs, which are always a challenge to enforce, various employee signage, which is almost always safety related. Keep in mind, health and safety is an important component of, of facility development. So you have to have room for eye wash stations and fire extinguishers. You may wish to have shower and, and locker room facilities so your employees can change into their uniforms and then change out before they go home. Uh, it's also important to understand how to re design signage so it can be readable. This comes from the, um, trying to remember, the initials are USSC, which always confuses me with USCC, but it's a sign, it's basically the signage council. United States Signage Council, which has developed a legibility index. This is the distance in feet at which a sign is readable for every inch of letter height. So if you're going to read a sign from 30 feet away, then that sign has to have at least one inch high letters to be readable at 30 feet. If you want somebody to be able to read it at 300 feet, those letters need to be 10 inches tall. So you see here with different... Uh, legibility indices in this table on this slide based on font, based on letter color, background color, uh, and uh, things like that. Interesting, um, I had no idea there was this much science behind signage. Okay, so another key question is future expansion. Every composting facility starts out with the greatest of hopes and always starts out small this is one of, the few, one of the few fields of endeavor that truly is a field of dreams type business where if you build it, they will come. And those, those, those growth plans have to be accounted for in your site design and in your site selection. So you've got to make sure you've got good setbacks and buffers from groundwater, surface water, wells, property lines, airports, residences, and sensitive receptors. Groundwater is usually something on the order of three to four feet on the Maryland Eastern Shore and Virginia Eastern Shore and in Delaware. Uh, usually the, uh, it's limited to a two foot or, or more. It's less than two feet. You have to harden the surface. Surface water setbacks tend to be in the area of 100 to 300 feet. And that's usually from a, what's called the blue line stream, which is a stream visible as a blue line on a USGS topographic map. In reality, any kind of drainage way or that conveys runoff, you need to be at least 100 feet away from it. Wells, usually about 100 foot to a quarter mile setback. Almost all states regulate a 50 foot setback for the property line. Uh, 50 foot is about the length of my house and that's really not very far from a property line. So that needs to be considerably more in my view. Uh, airports, Airports, you have to be at least 5,000 feet away for a um, piston-engined aircraft, which would be your general aviation, the small Cessna-type airplanes. Uh, you have to be 10,000 feet away if it's a turbine-powered aircraft. So any jet-type aircraft that use an airport, uh, you have to be 10,000 feet away from there. Residences, most rules require, most states require three to 500 feet setback from any residence you do not own or occupy. And of course, sensitive receptors is a catch-all term that we use in the industry. I define it as anywhere the public gathers, park, hospital, church, a shopping center, anywhere where there's a group of people getting together for some social or business function is a potential sensitive receptor. You have to understand where they all are and how far away they are. This picture shows a, a site near Charlotte, North Carolina, where at one point in life, it was a 350 acre dairy farm. Uh, it got sold off in pieces for development as the Charlotte metropolitan area grew. And those people now sit out on their deck, drinking their tea or coffee, watching him turn his windrows. He's had a very difficult time of it since these houses got built. Again, people smell with their eyes. You want to be behind a good buffer. So the buffer not only hides, and hides not the right word, but it does make a facility less visible. It also cuts down on noise. It 
cussed out on odor because a lot of odorants are attached to dust particles that are intercepted by vegetation. And this can include berms and walls. One site I developed in Virginia, we built berms made out of coal ash. Uh, I don't think we're allowed to do that anymore under the new regulations, but back in the early 2000s, we did it and made a berm that was 20 feet wide at the base and eight feet tall. And now we planted that with uh, vegetation on top of it. It made a very nice screen. But you can site it, take advantage of hills and fields and woods uh, and railroads and other forms of things, other forms of, of land use that help disguise the site. This is a very robust buffer zone in front of a composting facility in Vermont. Clearly hard to see if it weren't for that entrance gate. This is a deliberately planted buffer zone. Now notice that it's a bit thin in this picture, but it will eventually flesh pull out. You also want to have both an understory and an upper story. So you really need to have a series of lower height vegetation rather than just your tall trees because of the, the fact that you need to intercept any um, dust or odors or visibility issues coming along this lower lower canopy. So a two-stage vegetation system is ideal. Poll question number two. The signage legibility index measures the size of a sign needed to convey a message for a given letter size the distance for which the sign should be readable, the amount of lighting needed to make a sign readable, or whether the sign is visible from the road. Which one of these is correct? You have I'll give you 10 seconds to answer this. Okay, folks, I've launched that poll. So getting quite a few, uh, quite a few different answers here. So I think this is a little more challenging. Maybe just another five seconds. Craig, just be aware too, we noticed the, I think there one time you were sort of pointing with your mouse. We're, we're not able to see your mouse. So uh, just be, just be, be aware of that. All right. Well, in the poll and I'm sharing the results now. Well, most people got it right. Number two is the correct answer. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on to the topic of pad design. Now this is the cert we normally consider a composting pad, the area occupied by the active compost piles. Many state regulations now extend that to feedstock receipt and storage, feedstock processing, and in many cases, curing and compost storage. So while we call it the active compost pad, I think we need to think of it more as uh, the entire uh, manufacturing facility. Okay, what are the keys to design? We have to have adequate firmness for year-round access and operation. If you're composting in Arizona, you probably don't have a whole lot of wet weather conditions to worry about. If you're doing it in the mid-Atlantic where we get 40 to 42 inches of rain per year and we have wet winters, you are definitely going to need to plan on a pad that has adequate stability and firmness for a wintertime condition. The pad needs to be sloped to allow water to flow away. Uh, needs to be sloped at a minimum of 2%, which is a quarter inch per foot, to make water run downhill. You don't really want it to slope much more than 6 to 8%, because it's, it's particularly with a windrow turner, because it's very hard to drive a windrow turner in a straight line on a steep slope. Uh, your pad should prevent the opportunity for odor forming conditions and in our odor management class we'll talk a little bit about those is basically you don't want puddles where the fines and the rich organic material will get in the puddle draw draw flies and vectors and create odors and of course you have to meet whatever the regulatory requirement of a state is this is a traditional compacted dirt pad they work fine in dry weather they don't work so well in wet weather. One of the problems here with food waste on a on an earth pad is a lot of this food waste will get smushed, and that's a technical term, get smushed into the mud, and you will never get it picked up. It will just be an unpleasant, nasty mess. 
This is an asphalt millings. Uh, I, I like that as a good working surface. Also, uh, crushed concrete, recycled concrete, RC6, makes an extremely nice pad if it's graded out and compacted. Because over time, in both asphalt millings and with crushed concrete, compost finds, you see some of them here, kind of get down into this upper layer of the crushed concrete or the asphalt, and they kind of glue everything together. So it's a good, it's a good pad. Your loader operators, however, need to be very careful to keep the bottom edge of their loader bucket parallel and maybe an inch or two above the grade so they don't dig it up and put stones in the final compost. A pile of asphalt millings here. Uh, this is remilled. This is also remilled asphalt. This is the uh, soil cement pad, the original soil cement pad at the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center where we teach this class, but we do it in a face-to-face -face mode. Um, I think this pad has since been rebuilt. Gary, did they use uh, soil cement to rebuild it this time? They still haven't funded that, Craig. Oh, okay. Soil cement is a mix of uh, clay soil, fly ash, and lime, and water, which sets up a pozzolanic reaction in the soil and turns clay soil into uh, sort of an in situ form of concrete. And of course, concrete, um, the, the best working surface to have and the most expensive to build. Uh, this is an on-farm operation in which the farm fields are used as the compost pad, but it moves around the farm, so there's no real impact in one spot. Looking at your construction options for pads, durability and cost, should the highest on the, and going from bottom to top, going from lowest to highest, durability and cost. Lime stabilized is the same thing as uh, soil cement. Sometimes it's all you need is a concrete pad for mixing, uh, where you have your mixing. In this case, this is a grinding area uh, where you've got a lot of traffic and a lot of wear and tear, and the rest of it is just asphalt. Here's an example of a pad with a push wall uh, for mixing your ingredients together, mixing your feedstocks. Hell, now we'll do a little bit of a math exercise. Um, we've been looking at a site that we think we're going to buy for a composting facility. We get a soils, engine, a soils firm out there to take some soil samples, and they do a lab test, and the soil, set, the soil test comes back showing a soil permeability of 0 0.18 inches per hour. 0 0.18 is about an eighth of an inch. Eighth of an inch is 0 0.1875. Uh, so the question becomes, if that's the soil permeability, does that meet the regulatory standard in this particular state for a composting pad? I got into this last week on a project in New Jersey where the New Jersey regulators insisted that the soil have an impermeability measured by one times 10 to the minus seventh centimeters per second. Now that is the standard for impermeability of the liner of a hazardous waste landfill. That standard has been morphed into the standard for composting pad impermeability, not because it's really needed from an environmental standpoint, but because it's measurable. So the question becomes, if our soil sample is 0.18 inches an hour, does it meet the, the, this impermeability standard? So how do we solve this problem? Okay, we know it has 0.818 inches an hour permeability, and our standard is 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. So we have to convert inches to centimeters. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters. So 0.18 inches is 0.457 centimeters per hour. So now we have to convert from hours to seconds. The math is shown here. We're dividing by 3,600 seconds in an hour, or we're multiplying by the inverse of that divisor. And so 0.457 divided by 3,600 equals 0 0.000127 centimeters per second, or converting that to scientific notation, 1.27 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters per second. No, it does not meet the standard. The New Jersey project last week, the soil measured out at 2.15 times 10 to the minus 6. 
Again, very close to the regulatory standard, but not close enough. So that's how that math works. If you get a soils test showing inches per hour permeability, this is how you convert it to compare it to a regulatory standard, which is usually expressed in scientific notation and in terms of centimeters per second. And that concludes today's webinar. Uh, do we have any questions? And my contact information is shown here. I invite anybody to contact me at your, at your leisure uh, to discuss composting. I love to talk about it. I'm happy to answer any other questions, either online or offline. And with that, I'll turn it back to Gary and Mark. Okay, if you're going to ask questions, I'd appreciate it if you could do it in Q&A. We get to archive those questions and maybe try to improve things next time we do a webinar. I think we have time for a few questions. Mark, what, what do you have on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got time. Yeah, we're at uh, 247. So I mean, we're okay. two or 15 minutes away from the one hour mark. So yeah, we've got time. Craig, while we're waiting for questions, like I'm curious with that last example you gave in New Jersey, it, is there anything you can do to go back and, and make the soil more compact? So it's within a regulatory standard or basically you're just sort of SOL one if you can. If, if you fail. Soil testing is there's no reliable way to test the permeability of soil in the field. You have to take a chunk of that soil out of the field, take it back to a laboratory, and recompact it to simulate how it once was in the field. That removal and recompaction step never brings it back to the full condition it was at when it was in the, in the field itself. And that's one of the inherent flaws of permeability testing of soils or actually of any kind of testing of, of materials that are extracted from where they where they sit. But no, there's no way to really make and the state is fairly firm that if it doesn't meet that one times 10 to the minus seven standard, then the composter has to put down some form of hardened surface that is one times 10 to the minus seven. And that could be a, uh, a plastic liner with a leachate collection system, or it could be concrete, or it could be asphalt. The interesting now, uh, the interesting paradox is, concrete and asphalt are not impermeable, particularly may, asphalt. If you measure, if you run the same kind of permeability test on concrete or asphalt, it always comes back around ten to the minus four, ten to the minus five. Hmm. So it's a little bit of a fallacy that concrete is impermeable. And is that also, is, is, so is that the same as a perk test? I don't know if that's sort of a street term, but you know, well, we hear about for residential areas, counties and zoning districts will do a perk test. I mean, is that essentially yeah, a perk test? Is a, a perk test measures the rate of water, of water infiltration in the soil. So it's the same kind of test. Yeah. Okay. There's a question from Laura in chat and Laura, these slides, may or may not be available, but the webinar itself will be available online in three or four working days. Mm -hmm. And so where, where you see this um, in, in the e-extension, there'll be a link in there to the webinar later. I'll put a link in. In fact, I'll, for, uh, I'll put a link in chat so if you guys will watch that. So a link to the recording will be there. I'll take the slides. I've got, um, Craig, you sent me your slides earlier in the week. Have they changed any? like in the last uh, day or two. We do have a question though. Okay. But anyway, I'll, I'll put a link to the slides in that learn uh, link that I just put in chat. Gary, do you see Bobby's question? I do see Bobby's question. I had sent him a, a note okay. and there is a couple of publications that give detailed steps to create lime stabilized pads. Um, about evaluation, I don't know if those manuals have anything about evaluation, but they do tell you how much hydrated lime to add. Uh, I haven't looked at those things in three or four years, so I'm not sure of the exact contents, but I do have them in my office. So I will get back to Bobby if he'll send me an email somewhere and send it in chat. Uh, our next webinar next month is going to be on water management, which is really more of handling design. You, you have to design water management. It doesn't just happen by accident. 
Well, I think one of the challenges is how do you define leachate? And this has been kicked around through a number of regulatory uh, rewrite efforts in various states. One issue, we, we spent a lot of time on this in North Carolina as part of their regulatory rewrite and came to the conclusion that leachate should only be that liquid that drains completely through a compost pile that comes out beneath it. The vast majority of incoming rainwater actually flows off the pile. So in North Carolina, they decide to, and Maryland does this as well, it's called contact water. So it doesn't have quite the same characteristics as a true leachate that permeates through, but the reality being you still have 237,000 gallons of material that has to be handled. Um, we have seen that the reason so there is so much water is that oftentimes what happens is those compost piles will soak up a certain amount of water for the first two or three or four inches of the pile and then that saturation creates a hydraulic barrier to any further saturation and so everything else just runs off the sides. Uh, in the analysis I did for this site in New Jersey, we found that some of the work that has been done at Ohio State University in the uh, work on compost blankets and their effectiveness showed that for a four inch thick compost blanket, a significant delay in the start of runoff and a significant reduction in the total quantity of runoff. And that is analogous to an open air turned windrow composting facility in normal rainfall, which is why the literature reports that a curve number, which is a method of calculating the amount of runoff, the curve number for a composting facility is about 68. So only 68% of the incoming rainfall ever gets converted to runoff. Now in the case of a severe weather event like Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Irma or Harvey or any other severe storm, yeah, there's always gonna be a lot of water and it's unfortunate that they're treating it all as leachate because quite honestly, it's not all <laughs> leachate. Gary, any thoughts on that? About the only thing that is fortunate is that typically you're not responsible for things that happen above a 25 year design storm. And so you won't be crucified for the runoff that you can't capture out of a hurricane. See you all next month. Okay. Yep. Thanks folks. Thank you folks. Bye-bye.